if I could be a resource to you, I look at it as a win-win. Don't look at it and say, hey, this guy's fucking busy. You know, he's running the number one team in the company. Nah. Like yeah, you supermodel thing. Tell that ass busting out the bottom. I'ma lose my money in it. Crazy that medulla obligata. So the question is, how do I sell rate and fees? So in this example, Mr. Jones said, I want a lower rate market. Let's just say 3.2530, you're fixed. This was his immediate request. But the truth of the matter is that Mr. Jones is not just interested in a lower interest rate. The 3.25 that comes out of his mouth is because that's the advertisement he remembers seeing. And so he's just going to say 3.25. But as loan officers, we need to change the way we hear this. Instead of thinking he wants a lower rate, we need to understand he just needs a lower payment. And so Mr. Jones shares with us what would he do with the monthly savings. The monthly savings would go towards credit card debt. And so now I need to figure out how much in monthly savings does he need? In which we did because we found out how much total credit card debt he has. So he already said he spends $500 a month just on credit card debt. Now of course we're going to find out that this is probably a good, let's say 25k in credit card debt. Mr. Jones is ultimately looking for help to pay this $500 in credit card debt. He not, he's not necessarily looking for three and a quarter, he just needs an answer, a solution to the $500 in credit card debt. Now Mr. Jones' current payment, his payment now on the mortgage, and I'll give a realistic example. So let's say his current payment on the mortgage is $2,500, P-I-T-I, -I, however you want to take it. And after the refinance, he's looking to for a payment of three thousand. Oh, I'm sorry, two thousand. Ultimately, right? So he's looking for five hundred dollars in payment savings to offset the credit card debt. Now, in this refinance, if we did not try and sell Mr. Jones on rate and fees at the very beginning of the conversation, we could then ask more questions and figure out what these other pillars are. And so now we need to know what our pillars are. Does Mr. Jones even have the income? Does he even have the capacity, the equity? Does he have the, the right credit? Right? Is there any clouds on title, things that are going to interfere with our ability to pay off his current mortgage and possibly pay off the credit card debt? So even though he's asking for three and a quarter, you and I now know that he's really just looking for a solution for the $500 in, in debt. So I, figuratively, he's trying to drop this payment from $2,500 down to $2,000. Mr. Jones is not like us. He doesn't understand mortgage like you and I. So he figures the only way I can drop my payment down to $2,000 is if I drop my interest rate. And so I need a lower interest rate. And this is why Mr. Jones is asking for the lower interest rate. But little did Mr. Jones know that we can offer a cash out refinance and possibly pay off all this credit card debt. Even though it's not three and a quarter, and let's just say it's four and a quarter, it really depends on how we go over that with Mr. Jones, right? Mr. Jones asked for three and a quarter. How am I going to sell this guy on four and a quarter? This is how. At the very beginning, when he mentioned that he wants three and a quarter, when you find out that he just ultimately wants a solution for the $500 in credit card debt, we can offer him cash out to pay off $25,000 in credit card debt. This would ultimately pay or remove $500 in liabilities from Mr. Jones. Now, because I know he pays $2,500 on his mortgage now, I know if I combine these two with the payment deferral that all of our clients receive on a refinance to get the skip of payment, I know that I've already accounted for $3,000 cash flow. And typically, that might account for all of your closing costs, so if you need help in selling closing costs, there's an alternative option for you. But here's the thing is that when we sell higher rate and when we sell higher fees than what our prospects are, are looking for, we have to really press on the solution, right? And kind of shift their focus away on pricing and, and costs and really just look about the solution. Look how, how positive of a, of a change we're giving to our prospects budget, right? Now, so now if I'm able to save you $500, Mr. Jones, isn't that great? But the problem is though, is that when we add this 25,000 to his mortgage, this payment is probably not gonna change too much. If anything, it might even go up. 
And so now he's just going to be looking at this payment. And the issue is how we get Mr. Jones to say, hey, this is not your payment, though. You have to keep in mind that you're paying currently right now $3,000. I'm dropping this total $3,000 payment, and let's just say I'm taking it to $2,750, right? And this is at the pitch time. So reality is, I'll even make it even more challenging for you, is $2,800, right? And that's with the $25,000 cash, that's with all of our fees, escrow and all that good stuff. And so everything comes out to $2,800. So Mr. Jones is now saying, well, Daniel, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I was coming in to drop my payment at $2,000. You're telling me you're selling me $2,800. No, Mr. Jones, right now you're, you're currently paying $3,000. So I'm going to drop that total payment at $2,800 and I'm going to save you $200 a month. You no longer have this $500 payment. Now the challenge is how do I get Mr. Jones to get over this $2,800 payment? Because he's used to sending $2,500 to the mortgage company. He's not used to sending $2,800. Even if Mr. Jones doesn't understand that he's not spent sending $500 anymore to his credit card companies, and even if he doesn't understand that there's a $200 a monthly savings, what Mr. Jones does know and will understand is that this is all just a stepping stone. And so now what I do is I look at how this credit card debt may have affected Mr. Jones right now. And so I'm going to find out that because he's been uh, juggling all this debt, that $500 really ate away into his savings. You know, Mr. Jones has kids. Mr. Jones has a, a stay-home mom or stay-home wife. And Mr. Jones also needs to buy all these other things and these other random events that he has to conduct for his family, whether it's vacations or whether it's, you know, braces or a new car or their current car broke down and so they needed a new ride or they needed a new fix. There's just these other things that we don't expect that comes in and could have eaten everything alive. This is probably where most of the credit card debt has come from to begin with. And so when people have this much credit card debt, they don't necessarily have as much money in savings. And so really now that's where our focus is, is that, well, Mr. Jones, Jones, this $25,000 in credit card debt really ate into your savings. You had mentioned to me in our initial conversation that you don't really have much left at the end of the month. As a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, you said you only have $50 left at the end of the month. This is very riskful considering that you're responsible for a stay-home wife and also your kids. This is also very riskful because if for whatever reason you didn't make a payment or you had another emergency, you only have $100 in your bank to cover a total of $3,000 dollars in debt and that doesn't even include your expenses or your utilities or the braces for little Julie you know you have to now shift the focus on top of that Mr. Jones this $25,000 in credit card debt did a number on your credit score it actually weighed you down a little bit and so after we pay off this credit card debt and after I create $3,000 of immediate cash flow plus your escrow balance of let's say another $2,000 I just turned your bank account balance from 50 bucks to $5,000 of immediate cash flow. Now, if you're asking me, Mr. Jones, is it worth doing it? Absolutely, only because I've seen so many people go down your path and choose to stay in that path. And then they'll call me six months later when the market increases and it's always just too late. But don't have to endure all the pain and the frustration and the emotional tie to this, this juggling of all this debt. I have a solution for you. Here's the upside. After we do all this debt consolidation and I free up this 5,000, I'm going to increase your FICO score. In the next six to 12 months, we'll go ahead and look at your options again. At that time, you should have X amount of money in the bank, you should have an X amount FICO score, and you should be able to consider other options to shorten the term versus having 29 years left or 30 years left on a mortgage. I'm gonna show you how to rehabilitate your credit score and your budget and your assets so that when we talk again in six to 12 months, we'll go ahead and look for that three and a quarter then. And the rate works, and we have an option. We can try and educate them on how the market works or we can educate them on how to achieve the goal. And the faster you can find a way to how to achieve the goal, then you can you shift focus away from rate and payment. That's the biggest uh, objection that you're gonna run into in this changing market. So I hope to prepare you with the ways to combat that. And when we find out that Mr. Patel really just wanted a 1.99 fix because he really needs to save $500 because he's now maxed out on the credit cards and his business has gone down. Does that make sense? These are real life events. Now I understand the true why. It's not that he wants a lower rate. He just wants a solution to the hole that he needs to fill. Get it? 
So then I'm asking Mr. Patel certain questions. It's like, okay, after I dig this out, I say, okay, cool. So you have, you, you, we have what's called a net net, and I have to report this to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And it's true, it's, it's basically equal state checking and savings balance, right? It's part of the 1003, so I'm not persuading him. This is information I need to know. But this is information that I can use in my own lever as leverage. And so I'm asking Mr. Patel and say, hey, I'm just looking at your gross income. You mentioned you're paying about $500 in credit card debts. Just out of curiosity, you know, your net income is obviously lower than this amount. After you, you, you receive your net income, you pay the mortgage, you pay off all these credit cards and everything I see in the credit report, plus all the bills, the expenses, the groceries, how much of your net income do you actually have left? And what Mr. Patel is gonna say, oh, I got about 1,000 or $2,000. But the key is you don't take that, right? You actually ask them, okay, cool. So it sounds like you're saving about 1,000 or $2,000 per month. You're putting that directly into the bank, great. What's your balance in that bank account today? That is the smoothest way that I have ever found to ask a person how much they have in the bank. And all it was was a funnel. So if you use that ideology and you try to figure out, okay, how do I ask this one, how do I get this one answer that's gonna make Mr. Patel buy from me? You have to reverse engineer from it, right? Well, how do I lead to that question? And that's exactly how that, that wording is. And so this is what's called net net. And when you phrase it, you now bring it more value. Just made it up but it's inside information, net net. Well, what's net net? Well, net net is the net of your net income. How much of February's income do you have left netting into going into March? You're gonna find that most, I think the statistics is that 80% of homeowners are living check to check. This is a very powerful emotion that you wanna attach onto if you wanna sway away from rate and payment. If you wanna play the rate and payment game, you wanna play the rate and term game, this is gonna be a whole waste of time, regardless of how good are the gates of the sale is. Make sense? This is an emotional sale. And this has to do with their mortgage, it has to do with their month-to-month -month expenses, but we look at it sometimes inexperiencedly and we look at it as a rate game. Like, oh man, I, this guy has 3.5%. Fuck, I, I just saw the rate sheet, it's at four and a quarter. Uh, this guy's not gonna buy from me. We make that justification, we make that choice. Disclose, because I'm about to show my cards too, right? So, so before I disclose and show them my cards, which let's, let's use for the example, just to entertain the idea, it's much higher than that broker LE, right? Mm -hmm. We'll even go a step further and say that that LE is fucking two, two weeks old. And we know for sure that that's outdated. And so now it comes down to pitch time, but hopefully before I show my cards, I'm able to make a connection with them to where I communicate the message of us being better than a broker or better than whoever it is at a time where I have them, meaning that I'm not going into the conversation right away as a battle, right? I don't say anything like, hey, um, just want to show you, you know, this LE so you can compare it to the other lender. I don't even bring that up. Mm -hmm. What I do is, is um, you know, I don't know if you've heard any of the, you know, like the content online, how to start the second pitch. It's always, hey, you know what? I was putting together the disclosures for you and I had a quick question. Before I sent it out, I wanted to run something by you. I got an idea, right? And, and the reason for that is because that you're, you're taking, you're you're catching them somewhat off guard, yeah, I got you. right? And then and then you you're you're communicating with them what you were able to extract in the first conversation. Of course, at the end of the day, they're going to come down the price. But this is an opportunity where it just depends on when we explain that. And so if we get them peaked up to a point where they they are now in the point, vulnerable, if you will, right? Saying that regardless of who you choose, whether it's me or Quicken or me or the other lender, you still have this issue. This is what I've discovered. Is that correct? And when they say yes, that's correct, that's solidifying that, they, that you paid attention to them. Just that alone is going to put you on a different level than whomever you're connecting with. Is it right? Because it's all about price. It's all about just here's an LE, here's the bottom line. And so I would put enough time just to deliver it at right then and there like so if you get if you get their emotional peak up to to a point and now you got them wanting you and say hey this is what this is what i what i have this is here's my idea if i can get you approved i'd be able to take your total payment down to this or we'd be able to do this whatever the benefit is right and say here's the thing though what i disclose to you is going to be as of market today and the reason why i'm sharing that with you is because you told me that broker le was two weeks ago and i want you to get day to day like exact relevant information Right, especially if you're going to hold back from all these benefits, meaning that like that's kind of weighing you back. Because I want to help you get these things, but at the same time, I understand you have have a uh, you know have a goal of comparing it, which is absolutely fine. I'm going to show you why we win in comparison to Quicken, and and that will help you. But at the same time, I want to help you get this done quickly. So here's the thing: 
if you if we're going to compare my disclosure to that one, right, make sure it's at least current. At the end of the day, we both go to the same location. The only advantage is I can do my my update real quick because I'm a direct servicer. They they might take a day or two. Now you're te- now you're selling off time. You're making it harder to do to do business with them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. But but you're presenting it at a time where they already want what you got. It makes sense. So now they're more inclined to give you their business. And let's just say that now now let's just say that oh no you know what this broker still got a good pricing. The broker was referred by my mom. Right? I say, yeah, absolutely, by all means, just get an updated document. Here's the thing is that that broker can't necessarily lock your loan until you're approved. I can't give you any of these benefits until you're approved anyway. So while you're working on that, because it's going to take him about a week to get everything situated, me, it's right away. You send it to me in about half an hour. This is why most homeowners in Orange County choose us. Gotcha. Make sense? That's pretty cool. Yeah, because yeah, I, I feel like I'm, I, like after, let's say they've been shopping me for like a week. Yeah. And I'm like... Oh, let them shop, bro. It's yeah, going to get to a wanna, point. You just, just let them shop. I just want to just move yeah. on. You know? Yeah. And then it's it's kind of that battle where, like, when do I, you know, stop wasting my time? When do you chase, somebody, stop chasing? Yeah. And when do I start, like, dialing down? Like, should I? But I feel like if you try to dial somebody down like that, they get they go on the defensive. Because right. They're like, I'm trying what do you mean dial them down? Like, basically, like, hey, can we get, like, an answer, like, you know, try to set up a time like when do you think you're going to make corner a them, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I try not to do that because okay. I feel like they go on the defensive. Here's a better way to 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 relay the same exact message. Okay, say, hey, I I you know from homeowner to homeowner, I completely get what you're doing, but but because I work in the industry, I know how sensitive the market is. Here's the thing, I can help you. When you get down to your bottom, you know your top two lenders, just make sure I'm one of them. And then before you make any move, contact me when you're ready. You see, my information is, is live, meaning it's as of today. That's the only benefit I can give you, right? It's just, it's all accurate. If you cross a bridge with us, you'll know you have a bridge to cross, right? I'm not just out to get, get a number. I don't operate that way, right? If you find value in, in our online reviews and, and why we're one of the largest lenders, right? Blah, 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 or sell NAF. Say then, then you know where to find me. But but here's the thing: is that you might take a day, you might take another week. Uncomparing, do your time. Don't make a move until you feel comfortable. But when you get down to your top two lenders, make sure I'm one of them, and just give me a chance to update my documentation, okay? And just leave it like that, that's right? Nice. Oh, so it's the same exact information, but it's keeping you in the running, and it's letting them know to revisit you when they're ready to make a decision, mm-hmm. right? And so and so, let's say if they call us back tomorrow. And they say, okay, you know, it's you and this broker across the street. This broker across the street said they can give me this, blah, blah, blah. And then, then we have a chance to kind of reframe and say, okay, well, let me see what I could do. But when it gets to pricing, we have an advantage as sales, right, as a salesman to say, hey, I got a full file. This person's put me up against a broker. I need this to win. And so now it's just a matter of finding the bottom line. Yeah, and then do you, do you see, you kind of put the ball back in the air court and then like when you at that point, you kind of just won't really want to call them too much. You kind of no. let them call you. Absolutely, I'll check. I'll 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 be confident to check in two weeks later because they're either shopping or they already started the process. Mm-hmm. Either way, I'm okay with it, right? Either way, like even if they started the process, here's my chance to come take it, mm-hmm. right? Because they're already in the momentum. It's like, hey, you ready to gather documents? Just send me over a copy, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's a win win. Same thing with like these inbounds, if, if or like a lending tree lead, you know, like internet leads get get slipped through the crack because no one's following up two weeks later when they're already in process. And and we're writing on the fact that they've had a bad experience and when we catch them in that bad experience, stay with that LO, we become the solution. You see what I'm saying? But you're yeah, you're you you're gonna come across that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just had had a couple couple of them where I was I was battling and I just feel like I I know that there is something something that I could have done. Mm-hmm. And it's probably, yeah, I just kind of put it in their core. I think I was just kind of blowing them up too much. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. It was just, I think I just needed to uh, kind of put it in their core. Maybe, yeah, touch base with them like every week or so. Yep. Maybe like twice. Yep. And from there on, I'll just shoot emails. I had um, Ethan and Shane in here last week. And we, uh, we compared it to, you know, like a hot chick at the bar, right? Like, you know, if you got their number, it doesn't mean that you blow them up. Like right away, it's just you seem too eager. Does that make sense? Same ideology, right? Like, okay, yeah. I don't, I don't want to blow them out. I don't want to seem too desperate. 
And so you might leave them off and say, hey, if you like, you know, if you like what you hear, you know where to find me. But here's the thing is that I understand you have you have to go see your thing. Go do that. Right. Invite it. That'll be different from everyone else because everyone else is oh, I'll beat them. I'll beat them. So so I'll reword it and say, let me show you why all the homeowners in Orange County prefer us. Mm-hmm. So I don't have any problem with showing you. But but if you want me to show you, I, I need to make sure we're all on the same level field. Right. Like I'm not I don't want to be compared to something that was a week ago because it's I'm doing a disservice to you. Whatever I give you right now is going to be accurate to today. So you're going to look at one form that's actually relevant and you're going to compare it to something that's irrelevant, meaning you're making a wrong decision at that point. Yeah, do you like, take the time to kind of explain if, they're, if the other lender is kind of hiding things on their LE to show lower costs? Do you kind of point that out to them or do you just, just spoof up? American, New American. If necessary, I will. Meaning, like it's my last, di- one of my last ditch efforts before I talk bad upon the company. Yeah. Right. Like where I try to find little, little, little caveats. Like, uh, well, what's this fee? What's that fee? Right. Um, yeah, because then I sound like a little. Yeah. You know it's, I mean? it, it, yeah. But I mean, you're doing it. It, it depends though on the timing and then also the way you say it. Mm-hmm. Right. So instead of saying, hey, you know what? What is this fee? How come they're doing this? Why are they charging that? We can say, hey, you know what? Um, my manager ran something by me. I completely missed it. I don't know if you saw it, but oh, check this nice. out. This is weird, mm-hmm. right? Break it down like that. So now it's not necessarily coming from you. It's like a managerial, like did a review, caught it. And it's like, hey, yeah, anyway, good, you know, approach, thought I'd point it out to you. If, you know, if that alarms you, it would alarm me. You know, I'm just saying. Yeah. But anyway, you know, <laughs> you know, just kind of brush right. it off, right? But you're planting that seed to revisit it. And so now every single engagement you get, and you're like, hey, by the way, did they fix that for you? Did they ever explain what that was about? Oh, weird, right? <laughs> you know, you do one of those. And, uh, and you kind of just position yourself with them. But they should always feel the kind of like the hint of, of that you're not a salesman, right? And so like you're, you're kind of just making moves, but at the same time, you don't really care if they're going to be part of the boat because there's plenty more that's behind them. Right. Yeah, that's the message that I'm trying to convey. I'm trying to hold myself back from, you yeah. know, hitting people up so much and kind of just letting them. Yeah. Because they do come back. I mean, people, yeah. people that I talked to about four months ago, you know, yeah. have like my number saved in their phone. Yeah. And so I think it, it's just, I just don't want to, I guess it's just finding, finding that medium, how to, uh, I don't know, you just get that gut feeling about somebody that, okay, it's time to kind of just, let him go, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you gotta you gotta set a limit. So draw a line in the sand and make an agreement that, you know, like um, depending on what stage it is, right? Because you might have pulled their credit already. You might have pitched them, and they know your cards, right? So that's a different that's a different approach as opposed to someone you know you can get benefit with, but you've never actually did an application with, right? Uh, or at least got confirmation that you're gonna do an application. So that's a different cause. Like that one probably deserves more attempts because they've never connected with you. Well, at the same time, if you have someone that you pitch and you showed your cards already and they go ghost, like they're not responding back, you're, you give it, like my line in the sand was three calls, three attempts, whether it was on that day or over a matter of two days, right? So I, but I'm, I'm doing certain things to increase the likelihood of me making contact. So I'm paying attention to their time zone. I'm paying attention to, uh, you know, like things like how far away they work from home, right? Um, when they're off, typically. And then maybe, you know, usually around the, uh, the uh, first part of the phone conversation, sometimes just to make sure I get a hold of them, like, at the, um, like I'll ask them and say, usually, you know, what time are you at home? What time do you get home from work? I got you. And right? stamp that. So right, stamp that. And so around. now you know whether or not they're dodging you. Mm-hmm. Because, it, cause like, the, the, where the challenge comes is where we don't want to give it up, right? We see maybe the commission or the upside. We see, like, fuck, dude, this one's solid. I, I want this one. I put a lot of work in this one. And so, but what happens is that that actually anchors us and we become attached to that file. And so now we're spending days on going after it. But, but here's the thing is that it starts fucking us up even more because we're like, fucking shit, this motherfucker won't answer the phone, right? And, and then that now follows us into our other calls throughout that day. And so if you have a line in the sand, it's three days with an agreement that you're going to revisit it in two weeks. So you're going to hit them up three more attempts. If, if they don't answer, they don't call back then fuck them, like two weeks later, right? They're not gonna hear from me at all for another two weeks unless they call me back. Mm-hmm. Well, at the same time, that third message is done in a way like this, you know, like, well, back up. So the first message is like, hey, this is Travis, give me a call, I got an idea, 
It's always an I got an idea, right? I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about it when we connect. Call me back. That's way more enticing or persuasive than, hey, this is Travis. I'm just giving you a call to follow up from our discussion yesterday. I wanted to see if you had any questions, mm-hmm. right? I'm here. I'm here until 7 o'clock, blah, 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 right? It's a little bit more enticing. They'll more likely call you back. The second time, you give them a call and say, hey, you know what? Um, I didn't hear back from you. I sent you over an email. I understand that probably a phone call is awkward. Just reply back to my email. Let me know you got this message. And that's it. And so now you're giving them one last out via email. If they still don't respond, then, then we know where we stand, right? Now the last message sounds something like this. Like, hey, you know what? My manager asked me to give you a call back the other day. That's what the idea was about. I apologize. I have I've failed to connect with you and relay his message. So if I don't hear back from you, I'm just going to go and withdraw the application by end of day today. I'm sorry I missed you. I, I wish I could relay this information to you. I think you'd find it interesting.